morning, everyone. Let's rise in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. All right, next week's uh, Acolytes up there. Uh, obviously you have your schedule. If you turn to page 120 in your catechism, 120 in your catechism, and to close the commandments today in the first part of the Apostles' Creed. <coughs> Here. So page 120. The closing commandment. What does God say about these commandments? Everybody read that with me. He says, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations, those who love me and keep my commandments. What does this mean? God threatens to punish all who break these commandments. Therefore, we should fear his wrath and not do anything against them. But he promises grace and every blessing to all who keep these commandments. Therefore, we should also love and trust in him and gladly do what he says. God here shows how intensely he wants us to cling to him alone. I want you at your tables to answer the question there and then open to Deuteronomy chapter 30 and read through that and talk about why is God making these threats and promises. Take about five, seven minutes to do that. Thank you. 
um, God is really big on this, his commandments, obeying his commandments, that we obey. Um, and um, so much so that, I mean, you read the threats and the promises. If you break it, God says, I'm going to bring these curses upon you. But if you keep them, um, I promise to bring you blessing. And, and that also spills over to us as well. That God says, if you obey my commandments, if you keep them, you will be blessed. If you break them, there will come curses. There will be punishments that come along with that. But this obey is contingent upon this. That we have faith. Faith always produces obedience. Obedience never produces faith. It always stems from us believing, trusting, relying what Christ has done for us. And faith produces that, that response in us that we want to obey because we love. We love God and we love one another. We said love is the fulfillment of the law. Always the fulfillment of the law, but it always comes from this thing called faith. And even this faith is a gift from God. So God reminds us again and again and again how much he loves us, and he gives us this faith. But we also have one in our lives. Sin. 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 And sin always makes who number one? I. It's always me, myself, and I. And so faith... When we say, oh, I'm going to put my trust in God, but sin is always there. Oh, no, you can do whatever you want. In fact, you're the most important person. And that's why we are confronted with God's law to remind us that this sin is damning us. We talked about the three uses of the law. That this second use of the law, this mirror use, that we are, oh, yes, I'm failing miserably by myself before God. And so that's why God says this. God always wants obedience, but it comes from faith. Faith that is a gift to us from God. And it's that's the natural, when we have faith and trust, we want to obey. We want to love with that. So that's what the close of these commandments is all about. Now, why does God describe himself as a jealous God? That seems rather strange. Why would he say jealous God? <coughs> well, one, and I want you to highlight the answer, God refuses to share his love us with other gods. Because he knows, he knows any time any other god comes into our life, whatever that might be, it's going to want to buy for first place in our lives. It's going to want to consume our lives. And God knows, God knows when that happens, things will not go well. Things will never go well when, when other gods try to, to uh, push God out. In fact, so much so that in the Old Testament, I mean, he talks about this in Exodus. He talks about this. You've got these idols. Oh, you're going to trust in these idols, these other gods. He says, you've got to get rid of them. I want you to trust in me because I'm a jealous God. I want to be number one in your life. And that will always have that. Now, what moves God to punish or bless? Well, disobedience provokes God to righteous anger and to punish sin. I want you to highlight that. Disobedience provokes God to righteous anger and to punish sin. And we call that God's alien work. This is not God. He doesn't wake up every morning wondering, oh, how am I going to punish my people? I'm punishing everybody. That's it. He gets that far from him. He wants to give God his grace, his love. But this provoking, this disobedience provokes God's anger. God's anger um, throughout uh, in our lives. In the Old Testament, we see it all over the place. When the children of Israel were disobedient, God showed his anger to them. Many times it was shown in the invasion of foreign powers that, they, that uh, the children of God would realize. With famines, with uh, pandemics, with a whole bunch of other things that um, were being brought about. So that's why God was always very conservative, concerned about that. But letter B, I like this, God's undeserved loving kindness, grace moves him to forgive and bless us for the sake of Christ. This is God's proper work. 
Yes, we disobey. Yes, we fail miserably. But, but God in his grace, as a gift from Christ, because of Christ, God forgives us. And this is what God wants to do. We heard that in, in the second reading today in Romans chapter 3, where Paul talked about that this grace is from God. The law never saves us, because it always points out our disobedience, always points out our shortcomings. But God's grace, his undeserved love, that God is always moved to forgive us and to bless us because of Christ's sake. That's what God wants to do. That's what motivates him. That's what moves him to uh, come to us and share with us his good news of his salvation for us. Now, question number 95. Go to the next page. What is our proper response? What is our response to God's warnings and promises? One, we should reject all gods. We should reject those things that want to be number one in our lives, other than God. No matter what that is. No matter what that is. The question, I always ask the question, what consumes you the most? What do you think about the most? What is uh, about most? Those are gods. Those are idols in our lives that want to take over. And, and God says, no, you should be consumed with me. You should be wanting to be wanting to know what I'm thinking, what I'm, what I want to give to you, what the, you know, this wonderful gift that God gives to us. B, we should turn to God in repentance, trusting in His mercy for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Always turning to Him. We will always have gods in our lives, and as you go through your life, your gods will change. You will always change. Um, and deal with that. Ask your parents if they worry about the same things they, today as if they worried about when they were your age. I will make a bet it's not the same. And then ask your grandparents what they're concerned about, what they're worried about, what consumes them. Um, it won't be the same as they were your age. Never the same, never the same. The devil's always clever in wanting us to take our eyes off of Jesus, eyes off of God, and to focus on things that really have no lasting impression, have no lasting effects in our lives, and doing that. Then, letter C. I like this. We should eagerly seek to know God's will and gladly do what he commands. That's what God wants. God knows what's best for you. He knows you better than you even know yourself. Even know yourself. And, and he gladly wants us to do what he says for us to do. Because he knows what's best for us. What's best for us. Our struggle is, we struggle with this. Sin. Sin is always inward. Always turning in ourselves. And God says, nope, don't look at yourself. Look at me. I know it's best for you. I know it's best for you. And sometimes we got to do this. I know I said it should come from this, but sometimes we got to do what's best. There are some days keeping the commandments are pretty easy. Well, I can do that, and we do that. Very easy. There are other days when the commandments have to keep you, have to keep you in line, because. God knows what's best for us. He knows what's best for us. I'll never forget, when I was your age and older, especially when I started driving, my mom would always say to me before I left, remember, Jesus is always with you. Because I knew what I was going to go do, and I don't think Jesus wanted me doing that. Ugh. Sin. Then, no, what does God want me to do? He wants me to obey him. He knows what's best for me. He wants me to, to make that happen. When my kids were younger, one of my things that my kids would always do is jump on the couch. Don't jump on the couch, Nathan. You might get hurt. What did he do? He jumped on the couch, and he got hurt. And what did I want to say to him? I told you so. But what did my wife want to say to him? 
oh, are you okay? You didn't get hurt. And I'm going, I told him not to do that. I told him not to do that. Yes. God is always, <coughs> always talking with us. Always with us. That's why the importance of keeping God's word in your lives. Always there. That, um, that we have that. Now, connect, connections and applications. How does God carry out his punishment and blessing in this life? Highlight this. God punishes by subjecting us to the difficulties of our earthly life in a fallen world. Like today, I don't know if you notice, I'm suffering from a cold. Ugh. What a pain. Ugh. Also, my back hurts. Ugh. I'm tired. Ugh. It's all part of the, our life here. And really, not necessarily have to do anything with sin, but just the difficulties of life here on earth. <coughs> the difficulties of that and seeing that. You could turn on the TV today, you watch the news, you see what's happening over in Israel and all that's going along with that. We live in a sinful world. People want to kill each other. We live in our own country where people are fighting against each other. We're reminded of this, and sin always has its way. If it's not kept in check, sin will have its way, and sin wants to destroy. Sin always wants to destroy. So part of this punishment is that we do live in a sinful world. Two, B. I like this. By authorizing parents and other authorities to discipline us when we have done wrong. Yes. We do that. Now, uh, I'll give you a little secret. Your parents are not wondering what you're going to do wrong right today <coughs> so they can pounce on what you're doing wrong. I just want you to know that. Now, you parents, I just want you to know your children do not lie awake at night wondering what wrong they could do. It just comes naturally to them. It just comes natural. That's true for all of us. Remember, fourth commandment was God's gift to parents and other authorities in our lives to help us to live the way that God would want us to live. Because left to ourselves, we make bad choices. We'll always make bad choices. So sometimes parents have to say no. Sometimes parents have to say, you got to do this. It's for your own good. And let me let you know, kids, your parents don't have, to, don't have to have a reason to tell you to do something or not do something. You just do it because they said so. <laughs> because their parents did it to them. <laughs> now, I just want you to know that your parents are already praying for your grandchildren, and they're praying that they're just like you. Now, if you have any idea what I'm talking about, parents are laughing because they're going, I think mom and dad prayed that I have the same child as I am. Then we have that. So, you know, in dealing with that. And let us see, handing this over to our self-destructive habits and their consequences. Read, read with me. Just follow along. I'm going to read this in... Uh, our catechism uh, from first Romans chapter 1. Therefore God gave them up in their lust of their hearts to impurity, the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to the base mind to do what ought not to be done. The punishment of sins that God says is to give them over to their sins. We see that today in our world with our corrupted view of uh, marriage, corrupted view of the sanctity of life, the corrupted view of, um, you know, who am I? Am I a male or a female? I feel like this, but God made me this way, or God didn't make me this way, whatever the case may be. And part of the... the uh, uh, the, the punishment of sin is God hands them over to that. Hands them over to that. That they live in that lie. Now, does God always want to call us back? Always. Always does that. God always does that. Now, when we do obey out of faith, God promises blessings. 
A, I like this. Blessings the, uh, blessing the earth, the weather, and uh, the plentiful harvest. God does do that. B, giving us parents and other authorities for the support of life. That God places these people in our lives who have lived the life, who have been there, done that. And they can say, nope, don't jump on the couch. Nope, don't run in the street without looking. Nope, I'm not giving you the keys to the car yet. You gotta go through driver's training. You know, all of that goes along with that. That um, God places those people in our lives for our blessings. Then also, blessing us with health, talents, works, family, possessions. This is always a good thing. Now, it might mean that we don't always get what we want, but he gives us what we need. That sometimes, that, you know, in order to take care of ourselves, we let, he lets a little cold come into our lives. You know. But he gives us these abilities, these talents, these gifts, so that we can work, that we can be blessed. That God bestows these blessings upon us. And obviously starting next month, toward the end of the month, we will obviously celebrate Thanksgiving again. Uh, where we thank God for all these blessings that he's given to us. Now, the bottom of this page here, but I want you to um, see that, you know, every blessing of God flows from the fact that he sent us a Savior from sin in him. All God's promises are fulfilled. All the blessings we have, and the greatest blessing that we can receive is the forgiveness of our sin, is because of God himself, who sent us Jesus to save us from our sins. That's the great blessing that he gives to us. Yes, we do sin, and we sin much. But God, in his proper work, what he wants to do is forgive us our sins. Part of that is we confess our sins. Oh, I messed up, God. I deserve your punishment. But I ask for your forgiveness. And what does God do? He forgives us our sins and cleanses us from all unrighteousness, as we say in 1 John. That we that we have that so um, that we that we deal with that. Question number ninety-seven. Does this mean that when we live in a certain way, things will always go our way, the way we want? Nope. Nope. Not necessarily. Even Jesus, who lived the perfect life, suffered horribly. Therefore, we cling to God's promises and continue to seek. Living obediently, even in the face of trouble and difficulty, rather than seeking assurance of God's love and blessing of work. Invisible signs, manifestations. Believers will always experience trouble and suffering may result from their disobedience. Just because you're a child of God does not mean that you get all scot free. I mean, there's nothing bad that will ever happen in your life. I'll even, I will even say this that the more you trust in God, the more he will test you, and the more you will trust in what he has to say for you. <coughs> now, we didn't we sang the hymn or the psalm of the day today. Does anybody know what the psalm of the day is on Reformation Sunday? We sang it, a mighty fortress is our God. Does anybody know what psalm that is? Turn to Psalm 46. Turn to Psalm 46. First one, God is a refuge and strength, the very present help and trouble. Yes. Fantastic. 
Therefore we will not fear though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters were form, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. Wait a minute. If, if God is always for us, then, then why are these things happening? The earth giving way, the mountains moving, the waters roaring and foaming, the mountains tremble at its swelling. Oh! God never promised to take away bad things in our lives, but he has promised that he be in the midst of them. When I read this, I'm reminded of Jesus. Remember the story of Jesus sleeping on the boat and the storm comes and the disciples are all freaking out and they go, don't you care, Jesus, that we're going to die? And he wakes up. And you remember what he says to the sea? The winds, the storm going on. Peace be still. It was more like shut up. <laughs> he looks at me and says, where was your faith? So do you know who I am? I am with you. Even in the midst of the storm, I am with you. There's a couple things that Jesus does. Either he calms the storm in our lives, or he stays there in the midst of the storm with us. Always doing that. You know, the nations rage, the kingdoms totter, he utters a voice to earth and mouth. God is still in control, even though everything's going ah, crazy. God is still there, watching over us, protecting us, and taking care of us. And I like that, and be still and know that I am God. Sometimes we just got to shut up, be quiet, and listen. Just be listening. God is there. He's our fortress. He's our strength. Now, we often think of fortresses, you know, castles and things like that. But what's the... What is the fortress that God has placed upon you that you can always rely on? Uh, what, does, what did God give you? Holy Spirit. Yes, but where? No, where did he give you the Holy Spirit? What event in your life? Correct. And we say, in baptism, Christ puts on his robe of righteousness. That's the robe that we have. That even though this, all these things are happening, God is still watching over us. God is still watching. Now, what is the worst thing that could happen to anybody in this world? What's the worst thing that could happen? What's the worst thing? Ruin. Well, they would die without Jesus. Not even dying is not the worst. But dying without Jesus is the worst. When you die and you have Jesus, where are you going? Get a mate. You got it, mate. That fortress reminds us, that robe of righteousness reminds us that we are the Lord's. And he's going to take us home to heaven one day. He's going to take us home to heaven. What a great comfort that is to know that that is our mighty fortress. Because everything else, all these things are going to happen. Uh, nations will come, nations will go, there will be wars and rumors of war, Jesus says. But take great comfort in knowing that you are the Lord's, that you have that, that you have that as well. All right, turn back to uh, page 125 in your catechism. <coughs> Question number 98. What ultimately does God threaten against those who hate him and break his commandments? What does he threaten? What's the worst thing that can happen to you? Not only earthly punishment, but also physical and eternal death. I like that. This is the worst thing that could happen to someone. Someone who openly rejects God and his love for them. This is what God says. Okay, I'm going to give you exactly what you want. Life without me. And can you believe people actually believe that? <coughs> Question 99. Why does God warn children uh, whose fathers hate him 
it's said against him. God warns the children of such rebellious parents so that they will not intimidate their parents in, or uh, imitate their parents in hating and disobeying God, but will still love God and keep his commandments. See, that, that was the command, that was the, the threat. If you go back to that, remember we read the, the uh, what, why does God threaten? And he talks about punishing the children to the sins of the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. But showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. That this punishment goes on. Now, if you die and you end up in hell, it's your own fault. Nobody else's. It's your own fault. Can't blame mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, great grandma, great grandma. You made that choice. You do that. Now, you may be taught by that, but God, in his infinite love and wisdom and, and mercy, is always trying to share with you God's love and forgiveness. And we, as God's people, we need to share that with everybody. God wants us to share that with them so that nobody ends up in hell. Now, question 100. How carefully does God want us to keep his commandments? Well, he wants us to keep it perfectly in our thoughts, words, and deeds. Highlight that. Perfectly. To which all of you should say, Oh, no. Perfectly? Okay, I might be able to do it in deed. I might be able to do it in words. Or my thoughts? Really? Can't do it. We read, we sang this in our um, uh, uh, hymn of the, the first hymn we sang in a distribution today, if you haven't been to church yet, when we, when we did the salvation unto the verse 3, um, the great hymn writer, Paul uh, Spiritus or Sabratus. Uh, talks about how the law gives us this false dream of believing that if we just keep God's commandments, we will be saved. That's what the law does. But the law never saves. The law can never save. Because we always fail. We can never do it perfectly. Can anyone be saved by keeping the commandments? No! Because we're all disobedient. We all have what in our lives? We've been born sinful and unclean. Can't do it. Can't do it. <clears throat> Question 102. Where alone can sinners find rescue from the condemnation of God? Because of God's, highlight this, because of God's merciful kindness, he sent his only begotten son, Jesus, to rescue us from our sins. And the condemnation that we deserve, and our substitute, Jesus, kept God's law perfectly. He suffered, died, and rose again. Therefore, in our cru uh, crucified and risen Lord, we are free from our guilty punishment and the power of sin that we do. Jesus kept it perfect. Jesus did it for us. And like I said, at the waters of holy baptism, God places on you Christ's robe of righteousness. So that when God the Father looks at you and says, who are you? He sees that robe of righteousness and he sees Jesus. He sees Jesus. Oh. Or think of it this way. When you die and you get to the pearly gates and St. Peter's standing there going, why should I let you in? What's the answer? One word. Jesus. Because of Jesus. We'll go, you're right. You're in. It's only because of Jesus that we get in. It's only because of the love of Jesus and what he's done for us that God calls us his very own. That we are saved. We are saved. So this law thing and God calling us to be obedient always stems from faith. That gift that he gives to us to trust and believe that Jesus is the one who did it all for us. Continues to remind us of that. It takes away our sin. And we have that. Alright, turn to page 128. Alright, everybody say with me the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, 
born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Why does the creed follow the, the Ten Commandments in the Catechism? Why did Luther do it that way? The commandments are written on the hearts of all people by virtue of their creation. We call that our conscience. Now, some people's conscience gets a little bit more marred, or we don't listen to it as much. Uh, they reveal our sin and prepare us to receive the gifts of salvation confessed in the creed. Commandments teach us what we ought to do, but the creed, tells, the creed tells us what God has done for us and gives to us. That was from his large catechism that he wrote. Now, question 104. What is the creed? The creed summarizes all of God's word in creation and human history as taught in the Bible. Now, the word creed itself... It's taken from the last Credo, which means I believe. Literally, creed is what what is what what do I believe? What is my what is my faith statement? What do I trust in? You know, and it's more than creeds can be anything, you know, whatever that is. Oh, as my father says, you know, we only drive General Motors products. That's what we believe in. And what does he drive at the end of his life? A Honda. <laughs> we always buy GM. You know. So this credo literally means I believe. And if you notice that when we say the creed, what's the first word in the creed? I believe. You have to believe for yourself. You have to believe for yourself. This is what I believe. This is what I stand on. This is what I take comfort and hope in. And so uh, that is. And the creed, as we will see, we do the Apostles' Creed in the in the, in the uh, Catechism, um, and that we it's just confession of who Jesus, who God is, and what He's done for us. Now, what are the other two creeds that we say in the church? We have the Apostles' Creed. We also do the Nicene Creed. And what's the third creed that we do? The Athanasian Creed. And what day, what creed do we, what day do we normally say that creed on? On Trinity Sunday. So that's kind of a, it's a longer creed that we have um, and deal with that. Um, the Apostles' Creed, probably the end of the first century-ish, comes into existence as we know it. Uh, the Nicene Creed, it's about the fourth century. Um, and then the Athanasian Creed comes in about the seventh century. And if you notice, each of the creeds get longer and longer and longer. Because creeds were always in response to false teachings that were taking place. Especially the Nicene Creed. Ooh, kind of crazy back then because there was this guy named Arius who was teaching that Jesus was created. He was one of the first creations of God the Father. Well, if Jesus is a created being, then we're breaking the first commandment by worshiping him. And so they got together as a church and they hashed it all out. And uh, we got the Nicene Creed, and we hold to uh, what we believe about Jesus. He's part of the Trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Been here forever. Eternity. And does not have a beginning, does not have an end. Now, the human side of Jesus has a beginning. We know about that. So we celebrated that here in a couple months uh, with the birth of Jesus. Um, and then we have that. Now, the note on the bottom of page 129. Where it says, the witness of creation and the con uh, conscience can be called natural revelation. And, well, let me get to question 105 first. Sorry. Can we learn about God apart from the Bible? To some extent, we can. Learn about God as our creator. Creation witnesses to God, his goodness and his power. The human conscience also witnesses to God. And we, that. we call that a natural um, revelation. That we could look out and say, oh, there's a tree. 
somewhere along the way, someone put that tree together. Seed, planted it, whatever. And so we can say, okay, there's a tree creator. We can say things about this. What's this? It's a chair. What can you tell me about that chair? It's metal. It's got blue fabric on there. It's kind of squishy, which is kind of nice when you sit in the class for an hour. Kind of cushy. Now, can you tell me about the person who made that chair? Or person? But my natural reason tells me somewhere along the way, someone made that chair, put it all together. But it doesn't tell me who. Who did that? I don't know. Now, revealed knowledge, that's where the Bible comes in to, into play, where we read about what this God has done for us. That the witness of creation, oh, there is a God, but it doesn't tell us exactly who this God is. Then, question 106, then why do we need the Bible, the summary of the Bible, to, uh, to, to uh, as a summary of the Bible, such as a creed? Now, although, highlight this, although creation gives witness to the creator, it does not reveal his identity and name. In some ways, creation gives us the first chapter of the story. The Bible, in its summary in the creed, gives us the rest of the story. The Bible teaches us to know God more fully and for our salvation. Now, if we were just to look at nature, oh, look at that. Sometimes nature is very nice to us. Sometimes nature can be really, really mean. Meaning, oh, look at that. It's raining, plants are growing. Oh, wait a minute. There's forest fires. There's lightning and, and, and strikes like that. Oh, there's, you know, whatever. Which is it? I mean, we don't know the true God just by looking at nature. We need the scriptures to help us to do that to deal with that, and dealing with that. I kind of answer this next question, um, as, and the Bible teaches us more of who that is. Now, we do know about creation. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, give me the first four words. I'll everybody say it again. The first four words of Genesis 1, 1. In the beginning, God. And the question, the fifth word is created. In the beginning, God created. In the beginning, God created. And even that Hebrew word, it's a plural noun. And yet, the verb is in the singular. So, all of a sudden, reading in the original language, oh, this is a different God. Ooh, plural. It's not three gods, it's one God. And they're all there for creation. Hmm, interesting how that plays itself out. And uh, uh, we have that. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about when we get when we start working through the rest of the, the creed. I talked about credo means I believe. You can write that. If you not write that in your book, write it in your book. We have three creeds, as we mentioned. Apostles, Nicene, the Athanasian Creed. We use the, the or the Apostle Creed in this uh, in the in the Catechism that Luther wrote, because that's the one he used. It's also the one that we read during baptisms. Now, question 110. What is the Trinity? Guess what word is not in the Bible? Trinity. Nowhere you, will you find the word Trinity in the Bible. But the Trinity is everywhere. Already in Genesis chapter 1. Elohim bara bereshi. In the beginning God. Created. Oh, we have this. And then we have Genesis 1, verse 2. And the what hovered over the face of the waters? The what of God? The Spirit of God. And then we have John 1, 1, where John writes, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. By him all things were made. I mean, it was created. And so we have this, you know, while the word Trinity itself is never mentioned in the Bible, the Trinity is everywhere. 
at Jesus' baptism, the voice coming down, the dove coming down in the form of the Holy Spirit, and there's Jesus. And so we have that. We're going to talk about what this means, this God. When we say God, I want you to think Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, what, what, what distinguishes the Father and Son and the Spirit from one another? It's in their relationship with one another that distinguishes their interactions with one another. The Father begets the Son from eternity. The Son is begotten from the Father from eternity. The Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. I want you to highlight that. I'm going to talk about those, those three words. Begets, begotten, proceeds. All of them, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all eternal. Eternal. They've been there forever. Always. Always. But we have this thing called the Father. That's what we use. That's the Bible talks about that. We have God the Father who begets the Son. And the Son is begotten. Really what that means is that what the Father's thinking, the Son is thinking. What the Father wants done, the Son does it. That's what that means. It's not earthly, humanly speaking. It's, oh, God the Father's thinking this. And God's ultimate plan is for everyone to be saved. And the Son says, oh, yeah, I want everyone to be saved. And the Father says, this is how we're going to do it. And the Son says, okay, we're going to make that happen. And then the Holy Spirit proceeds to the Father and the Son. And what does the Holy Spirit do? Brings us to faith. To trust what the Son and the Father has in mind. What they want done. That we're in on that. That we're in on that. Um, that, we, that we have that. So that's, you know, we have this distinction. Yes, we have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So they kind of do their thing, but they're always working together. Always working together. If you get one, you got the two others. It's like you get one, and you get three all together. You know? What a great deal that is. You know, we can pray that the Holy Spirit would lead us to do the Father's will, and the Son says, this is the will of the Father, that you be saved. And the Holy Spirit brings you to faith, so that you can be saved. What a great, great blessing that is for us. In relationship to us, they are distinguished by their works. The scripture speaking, uh, Father is creating us, the Son redeeming us, and the Holy Spirit sanctifying us. And that's true, but they're all in on all those things. Like I said, the Trinity was there at creation. In Jesus saving us from our sins, the whole, you know, they're all there. And then the Holy Spirit working in and through us to bring us to faith. You get the Spirit, you get the Father and the Son. They're always there. They're always together. They're always going to make that happen. Now, what unites the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as one God? Their relationship to one another. The three persons find their unity as one divine being called God. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are almighty. They are creator and redeemer. So when you hear the word God, I always want you to think Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's always Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I believe in God. And part of it, and the God is our understanding is person, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we're going to go through what that means uh, for this, and that we work through that as well. Alright? B, in the relationship to us, that the three persons find their unity in the Father is both source and goal of their work. Out of love, the Father sends the Son. Together, they send the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit brings us to Christ, and in turn, shows us the Father's love. I'm going to talk about this more next week, so have a great week. Oh, this is rather big stuff.